Thanks, Phil. Uh, Thank you. Uh, as, as is my want when I, when I give a talk here or at the club, it's usually something I make up specifically for the purpose, unlike most of the speakers that you've heard um, the past few days. So this is a very crude presentation. And um, as you may have noticed, I don't mind interrupting speakers when they're talking. And I expect you to behave the same to me. If you disagree with me, if you don't like what I'm saying, if I'm not being clear, or you just want to ask a question, please go ahead and do so. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that you people have stuck in. I know I've got some good weather to help keep you here, and I promise to not keep you too late. But I do appreciate your sticking through, especially since this may not be one of the sexiest topics uh, in all of astronomy. And if I can figure out how this whiz bang thing works, let's have to turn it on. Okay. Who does the boring stuff? Star catalogs. Um, amateur astronomers very rarely are interested in measuring the positions of stars, but everybody wants to know where the stars are and the things between them, the galaxies, the globulars, and everything else. And somebody has to do that work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a little bit with the history of star catalogs. And everything I say must be right because I just read it on the web. Um, <laughs> it's not my area of expertise. But it, it's to set the stage for what I, I do know about, and that is how we did star catalogs for the Hubble Space Telescope. Because when Hubble was designed, we realized for several purposes the existing catalogs weren't good enough. Uh, and then a little bit about how that, uh, what followed from that, uh, which again I'm not a great e expert in, uh, but we'll talk a little bit about it and I'll emphasize the stuff in the middle. Of course in the ancient times people imagined shapes among the stars. Various civilizations came up with different uh, ideas of what was up there. Some of the constellations we use today came from North American Indians. Some came from the, the Ptolemaic tradition from Greece. Uh, people made stories about the stars. They tried to understand them so they wouldn't be afraid of them. They tried to track the motions of the planets among them so they could see what was new in the sky and what was old reliable, which tended to have religious and social significance to them, particularly through astrology, because it was a general feeling that things in the sky were mapped back and forth to things that were happening on the ground, and that's the origin of astrology. So they came up originally with uh, empirical shapes to help remember where things were. They told stories about these shapes. Uh, apparently there were 48 classical Greek constellations. Uh, of course, the Greeks could not see the entire southern hemisphere, so they didn't worry about those things. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we have some really bozo constellations in the southern hemisphere, because nobody cared. Uh, and I guess they never asked the Australian Aborigines what they thought the constellations were, so they never got to create any. Um, but in the middle declinations up to the pole, the uh, Ptolemy and the Greeks created stories about them. Uh, this is one example, Bayer, uh, Johannes Bayer, a German, uh, started to systematize what these pictures were in the sky and what the stars were that made up the pictures. This catalog was 1603, the Uranometria, uh, which was both uh, a collection of pictures of the constellations and lists of the stars that made them up. Uh, so you can see here sort of a classical view of Cassiopeia. You see in here what we talk about is the W, which are the brightest stars in Cassiopeia. You had a fanciful representation of eyes and a fe feather fan for the queen and a chair she was sitting on. Uh, when I learned it, I was told that this is the chair upside down and this is the back of the chair. And that was easier for me to remember. But different groups of people made up different pictures to go with the constellations. They stayed fairly stable as far as general outlines. So you could say, well, this part of the sky is Cassiopeia and the thing next to it is Cepheus and the thing in the other direction is Draco or whatever. But the thing that Bayer did was to try to systematize a little bit better. He gave them Greek letter designations. So he was the first one to say that the brightest star in Cassiopeia would be Alpha. Now, in retrospect, he didn't, it's not that he didn't get it quite right. 
it said he didn't have a way to truly judge star brightnesses. So he divided them up into classes. And in the case of Cassiopeia, his brightest classification group was third. It, it, this is in Latin. So this group of five stars are all in the group called third. And if he couldn't judge between them, he had various rules. Either he started with the north, or he started with the west, or something. He, he just gave them letters. Um, so in the case of Cassiopeia, he had third, fourth, fifth, sixth, uh, and the number of stars in each classification group. And those, I guess, were either his opinion or a consensus of what they would call the ancient experts. He also had interesting little factoids up here, like he gave the name in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Syriac, and Egyptian. Um, I don't know why they thought that was important, but maybe they figured um, if you were reading the Bible and you came across the name of Cassiopeia, I, I've never seen it in there, you'd recognize it if you stumbled into it in Hebrew. Um, and it was a step forward. But you'll notice that this catalog has no declination of right ascension. In, in the text here, what he's saying is the name that that star, the name of the function of that star in the picture. So uh, alpha here, I guess, is part of the chair. I don't even know what it says. No, it says shoulder. Shoulder, uh, shoulder and, and chair. Um, so everybody who had a common view of what the picture was like could tell which star was which by knowing the description of what purpose it served in the constellation, which is OK as a mnemonic for remembering what's what, but it doesn't help you with your setting circles. Of course, in 1603, nobody had setting circles, so it wasn't a big problem. OK, Flamsteed, 86 years later, a Brit uh, created a thing called, oops, called the British Catalog. I don't know why. Um, and now you see latitude and longitude. And he still has the narrative description of what these things are. This is also Cassiopeia. Are you curious? Where am I? Uh, Oh, this is Aries. I'm sorry, this is Aries. Um, by the way, both of these things, if you just, these old catalogs have all been scanned. If you Google their names or you Google their authors, you will find complete copies of them, which is, might be interesting for some of you. Um, so these are stars and Aries. Again, they're described by, um, by description. But the interesting thing, which I only discovered when I, when I started doing this research, was he did not assign what we call Flamsteed numbers to his stars. He made a catalog, uh, which was fairly complete. And then a Frenchman, almost 100 years later, said, I'm sick and tired of trying to figure out where these stars are. So he made a map that had Flamsteed numbers on it. This is the same catalog content, but he just put numbers in front. Uh, it's not clear why Flamsteed didn't figure out to put out Flamsteed numbers. But I suspect that what happened between Bayer and Flamsteed and the need for latitude and longitude was we're getting into the age of exploration and people needed precise locations of stars for navigation. So there was money involved and now it became an effort. Every degree of error you have in the position of the star if you're doing stellar navigation will land you roughly 60 nautical miles in error when you land. And if you're in France heading to French Canada and you're trying to hit the St. Lawrence River and you're off by 60 nautical miles and it's foggy, that can really spoil your day as, uh, as the first speaker, as one of the speakers is uh, this week went and was saying, you know, is the question the end of the earth or a bad hair day? Well, <laughs> you're off by sixtical nauti sixtical nautical mile, 60 nautical miles in the fog. It's more than a bad hair day. Um, so I think this, this just indicates that over this period of time between 1600 and about 1700, people get, got serious about positions. But they still weren't very good at it. They barely had telescopes, and if you've been to any 
very old European observatories, you will see classical observing quadrants. I'm sure you've seen pictures of quadrants where people looked along sight lines and measured the elevation of a star, typically when it passed the meridian, and wrote it down. And you could get pretty good at that. But to get the right ascension, you had to know the time. And people were not very good at telling time. So right ascension was difficult. They knew the theory, but they had to have clocks. And clocks were not generally available. So in general, and I don't know the numbers on this, the latitudes were probably pretty good, but the longitudes were wrong. And that means the navigation, typically coming across the Atlantic, by having the correct declination of the star, you'd end up hitting Virginia pretty much right. You'd be coming across that line of latitude. But having the longitude wrong, you wouldn't know when you were actually going to get to land by plus or minus probably something larger than 60 nautical miles. So you better have a good lookout, and you better be going dead slow if it's foggy when you're beginning to get in the neighborhood. And of course, that may not be easy to do if you're under sail. Jumping way ahead, in the 1800s and early 1900s, people got very serious about position. They said, this is something we've got to have for navigation, for surveying, for many other practical applications. Timekeeping got better. Uh, and it wasn't just ocean navigation. When the American explorers went to explore the West, they had nothing to do their maps with other than celestial navigation. And of course, they had a problem. They didn't have horizons. On the water, you have a good horizon in general. If you're Lewis and Clark, you don't have a good horizon. But they muddled through. Um, the state of the art in collecting observations, telescopic and visual, kinds of things the Naval Observatory did and all the major countries' observatories, national observatories, in, in the 1970s, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory collected basically a fully, con a fully consistent, complete map of everything down to ninth magnitude, and that was 250,000 stars. So this is getting to be a lot more than Bayer and Flamsteed and just a couple of stars. They, they got them all. And you know, we still use the SAO numbers for things like occultations. These are, when you get to 250,000, you're talking about very, very anonymous stars. But the occultation guys, the asteroid occultations and, and uh, planetary occultations, this is still very important because it puts the planets in the frame of the celestial reference system. So as long as you know where the star is and you see an asteroid come right in front of it, at that point you know absolutely where that asteroid is. And by the occultation times at different places on the Earth, you can tell the size and shape of the, of the asteroid. So that's one of the applications that motivated this kind of precision. This was also computerized. You could read it in a book. It came out in, two, in three forms, basically. There was a book which listed every star, its brightness in several bands, its motion in the sky if it was known, because people had looked at the motion of nearby stars, um, and the catalog reference from which it was pulled. Because this was really a catalog of catalogs. It wasn't original research. And then it was printed up as a series of book plates, which you, of, of map sheets, which you can't see very well, um, with a, uh, an overlay which you could put on any given page to read off more precisely the declination and right ascension of any particular star. So that if, for example, you, were, you thought you might have discovered a new asteroid, you could look back and forth between the telescope and the atlas page and see if there was a star known in that position. And then finally, there was a tape version. So this was effectively the first complete catalog which was available on digital tape. But when, and this sort of summarizes the situation. Uh, Bayer Flamsteed, uh, the Bonner Dutch something or other in German catalog was a, uh, a mid 1800s. The Draper catalog, Yale Bright Star catalog down to magnitude 6.5. Um, Wilhelm Leuten at University of Minnesota did a, a, attempted a comprehensive proper motion survey uh, with scanners, these blink comparators and things like that. So there, there were very specialized catalogs too, but that didn't really contribute to 
the comprehensive nature of the catalogs, it just added information to those which were already known. And then the SAO catalog, which was put together, actually 259,000 stars, complete to ninth magnitude with proper motion. Now, at the same time as these enumerations of measurements of discrete star positions, many of which were optical, uh, visual optical, people in the late 1800s began to realize, hey, we got this photography thing. Because in the mid-1800s, photography was only sensitive enough to take pictures of the moon, and they did that. But by the late 1800s, film was sufficiently sensitive that you could take pictures of stars. So uh, all the major observatories got together in the late 1800s and said, let's take a comprehensive picture of everything in the sky. And they divided the sky up into sections, and each national observatory got a piece of it. Um, European, American, Canadian, um, Russian, South African. I'm not sure if the Australians were involved in that. Um, but they all divvied up the sky, because the south southern hemisphere was the problem, because there weren't that many. So things like the Belgians from the Belgian Congo tried to observe the southern hemisphere. But as you can see, this is not a typo. The project took 59 years and was never really complete. And they realized after it was done, they had this mishmash of pictures, which were comprehensive, but they were all different. And every telescope had its own distortion. So if you actually tried to pull out from this collection of pictures where each star was, you had to calculate each observatory's telescope separately, and it was an amazingly complex computation problem. And I don't believe that there ever was a catalog truly produced from this collection of pictures. They had all the pictures. I don't know that anybody made copies of them, but they did exist if you really needed it. And nobody made a catalog. Nobody made a listing of what was seen. And because it took so long, the limiting magnitude was not consistent. You could see only the bright stars in 1891. You could see much fainter stars in 1950. So what happened as this fell apart, and of course a couple of wars came involved. I mean, World War I slowed the Europeans down. World War II slowed the Europeans down. So it was finally the Belgians finished up their part of the job in 1950. The um, National Geographic got together with Caltech and said, let's stop messing around. Let's do this right. And between National Geographic and Caltech, they got the funding from, I think they got it from Ocean. He's the guy it's named for now, to build a 48 inch Schmidt camera at Mount Palomar, the Ocean Schmidt. Schmidt. And that produced what's called the Palomar Observatory St uh, Sky Survey. And that's where our story gets interesting and where uh, the Guide Star catalog pick, picks up. Well, I, I'm, I didn't talk about nebulae, and I don't know the answer. Okay. But I'm sure it's on the web, and it must be right. Um, <laughs> you know, there, were other, there were many other specialists. Yeah. Um, I suspect it was the late 1800s for the NGC, and then the IC expanded it. Um, and I used to know that stuff, but those brain cells died. Um, OK, so why we're, why we're interested in catalogs? <coughs> Applied astrometric engineering, because generally you don't go to catalogs to say, gee, I feel like looking at a 12th magnitude star tonight. Let's pick one and spend a whole bunch of time looking for it, and then I'll see that there's nothing there. Well, I'll see the star, but there's a big a so what. Cool. What's that? There's a dark light. Cool. Yeah. Maybe, the, maybe you'll find one that they missed. You can get your name on it. Nothing like having a 12th magnitude star named after you. <laughs> so there are three things that we're really using stars for when, when we want to observe. One is in the finder scope to get you to the neighborhood of the thing you're really interested in, which tends to be one of the faint fuzzies, a globular, a double star, which would be in the catalog, or a nebula, a, a, a galaxy, an asteroid. So you want to have a reference, a series of reference points that you know you can find in the finder, get you to the neighborhood, and allow you to either star hop 
or use offsets or several other techniques to find the thing you really care about. The second thing is you want a guide star for many things, either for your own purposes where it's fairly trivial, uh, for visual purposes for which it's trivial, or for photography where it's not trivial because there are a lot of variations in drive mechanisms in the atmosphere and refraction. You want a star near the thing you're interested in so that you know if you can accurately track that star, you're also accurately tracking, tracking the thing you really care about, something that's easy to track. And then finally, in the main scope, sometimes you're looking at the star, sometimes you're looking at something nearby. You might be looking for a planet, you might be looking for a double star. Um, if I'm looking at Albireo, I can use it for all three of these. Well, I might not be able to use it for guide and main, but I can use Albireo, for example, both to locate the double star and then I look at it. So there's, there may be some overlap in these, but we have those three functions. Locate, precisely guide, and view. Um, and along with that, it's a little bit easy on the ground because I have a, a rigid mounting that gives me most of the control I want, but in what I'll talk about more in space, you have to rely, you have to be really holding on to those stars for dear life because there's nothing else to grab onto. They're what give you all the control over how you point the telescope. And this just illustrates an example of a telescope where um, there's a little finder scope in here. I don't know if you can see it. He's got a guide scope here and he's got the main telescope doing whatever it's doing. And those three things might right now be looking at three different things all to get the job done of taking a picture. Uh, in some cases, you're finding the guide star from the same field of view as your camera, what they call off-axis guiding. So you may do your, your guiding through the main telescope, but whether you get it from the main telescope or another one bore-sighted with it doesn't really matter. I'm using stars for guidance. So what happens when you spend $2 billion for a telescope called Hubble and they don't give you a tripod? Hubble has a nice big mirror here, a secondary mirror because it's a Cassegrain, a um, bunch of cameras and instruments and photometers here. And if you launched it in space and set it pointing at something and just didn't touch it, it would stay there pretty much. There are some distortions, but so far I haven't mentioned anything that causes the thing to drift. It's not attached to the Earth, so I don't have to drive it to follow the stars. It's in inertial space. If I stop its rotation, it will tend to, stop, to point in the same direction. Problem is, I've got these antennas which have motors on them. I have these solar panels which have motors on them. For every force, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Every time I turn that antenna left, this wants to go right. Every time I turn the solar array clockwise, the telescope wants to go counterclockwise in the ratio of the moments of inertia. So, uh, and there are other mechanisms inside, but those are the biggest ones. Every time I move something that's part of a supporting system for the telescope, the telescope would tend to move. The other problem is, how do I really get it to stop? If it's in motion, it would tend to stay in motion and rotation, and I've got to somehow get it pointed and zeroed in inertial space. And the way that's done, first thing that comes to most people's mind, uh, like we saw on the Mars lander, well, you have little rockets on it that go pss, 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 and they, and they keep it pointed where you want. Murphy's Law says that everything that you emit from a reaction jet on a satellite ends up condensed on your mirror because the stuff does not dissipate fast enough. It's like dew on steroids because it's nasty chemicals and they eat away at the mirror. So Hubble has absolutely no reaction control jets. As a matter of fact, when it was deployed in orbit or repaired, it was pushed off with the arm from shuttle with a velocity so it would drift at least, I think they ended up 15 kilometers, away from the shuttle before shuttle could use one of its reaction jets. It would have to be 15 kilometers away. In addition to the mirror, which would be a source of condensation, you have cooled cameras back here. And they really suck up the gas. And once it's on a cooled camera, you can't get it off unless you heat it up. They're nasty chemicals. So this is very adverse to any kind of chemical emission. And one of the problems was a lot of this was graphite epoxy. Graphite epoxy has hydrocarbons in it. 
And one of the reasons it took like three months before they first took any pictures was because they had to wait for, they had to wait for all the hydrocarbons from the graphite epoxy to dissipate naturally. Most of them are based, uh, water-based, um, they're, they're dissolved in water and they didn't cause a lot of problems, but it was a consideration. So no reaction jets. What it has someplace uh, around in here is a series of control moment gyros. Uh, I'm sorry, not control moment gyros, reaction wheels, which is basically a flywheel that if you kick it clockwise, the telescope goes counterclockwise. They're mounted in at least three different directions, so that gives you the three control directions. And you can turn these wheels as much as you want, and the telescope goes the other way. When you get everything balanced just right, the telescope stops moving. Um, and there's a smart computer on board that figures out how to do that. Um, there are also gyroscopes that sense where the telescope is moving. And there are other sensors, there are star trackers and sun trackers that get you roughly pointed. So you get roughly pointed in some direction. Actually, uh, initially, you just get pointed any direction. You then use the star trackers. You see what you're looking at. You figure out what those stars are by looking at catalogs on the ground and say, OK, I'm pointing here. And I've gotten my rate down to zero because that's, those stars aren't drifting. And now I can start deciding how far to move left, right, up, down, around to get to the star I want to look at. That's all the course attitude control. But that's not good enough because the gyros can't really tell you when you're at zero. Gyros have a thing called drift in them. And they tell you when you get close, but they can't really tell you zero. They tell you when they think you're near zero, that's all. And the star trackers are looking at the brightest stars. They have wide fields of view. They only get you roughly in the right direction. The objective of Hubble was to take pictures of stars, uh, not stars, but objects down to magnitude 21 or 26, depending on how you do it. Um, so looking at bright stars isn't going to do it. What they do is the three functions, which I, I mentioned before, finder, guidance, and, and actual light collection, in some sensor boxes called fine guidance sensors. And what happens is there's, a, there's an area in the middle, this is sort of a map of the focal plane of, of Hubble. In the middle of the focal plane, where the image quality is best, is where you have an array of, of different cameras. And they can take pictures or measure brightness or measure spectra. They're all preset, they're pre-designed to do those things. And actually you move this galaxy a little bit around. The, the, let's say the camera is here, the, the faint object camera is here, the spectrometer is here, the photometer is here, and the thing called the whiff pick, which is the one that comes up with the pretty pictures, it gets the middle of the middle of the field of view because the purpose is pretty pictures and they want really good resolution. So you move the whole thing around a little bit to put the thing on the camera that you want to use. While you're doing that, you have to first find the vicinity because none of these guys can really report to the ground what they're seeing. It takes them hours to make their observations, by which time it's too late. So what you do is you have to get finder stars in here, in, in two of these three boxes. They're three, separate, they're three copies of the same thing. One coming this way, one, one mounted in the telescope this way, one mounted this way, one mounted that way. FGS is number one, two, and three. You have to get a star you recognize in the first one, the brightest star you can get in the neighborhood. And you have to get at least one more star in one of the other boxes to verify that you've got the right neighborhood based on brightness and separation. You then get them, uh, after, after my course maneuver over to the neighborhood, let's say I, expect, I expected it to be here, but I found it here. So I changed the pointing direction a little bit, which is just like pushing your scope over a little bit, pushing your dab over to get it in the, the finder star in the finder scope. Um, and then because it's in space and I don't have an up down, I may have a roll control too. So I get the first star located on sort of a virtual crosshair. I get the second star located on its crosshair, which gets me the roll correctly. And then I have pretty good confidence that the thing I'm trying to image is in the middle someplace on top of the camera that was supposed to see it. That makes sense? 
with me so far? Okay, now these same boxes do double duty because once they get you approximately located in the finder mode, they go into a guidance mode. And each one has, in addition to a kind of camera, basically called a flying spot scanner, uh, that, that looks for stars by spiraling around, out, and out, and out. It has another mode where, okay, now I center on the sensor with an interferometer, a thing called a pointing interferometer, which is like a very precise theodolite that measures very small errors, left, right, and up, down, two separate sensors, in the position of the star with respect where I want it to be. So these are virtual crosshairs. These are virtual high magnification crosshairs that allow me to keep the star where I wanted it. And these, this mode of operation doesn't chase the star, usually, although there's another mode. It just sends an error out to the thing which is acting like the uh, pointing motors, although the reaction wheels, that says, the star seems to be drifting a little bit up, so give me a little kick in the down direction. And it's sending out an error signal. Generally, servo designs like to get error signals rather than positions. It's not telling you where the star is. It's just saying it's a certain number of thousandths of an arc second away from where I wanted it to be. And you point the whole telescope back. And by getting your star centered where you want it to be on this crosshair, then I will, without fail, get the target back on the camera where I want it to be. And of course, this can go on for 24 hours on Hubble. Um, this is a little bit hard to see, but what's happening here, this, this is part of, of one of the original planning uh, documents. The, at, at the end of a slew from the last thing you looked at, let's say I was up tonight and at sunset I'm looking at um, Vega. And I look at that for a couple of hours and it's getting lower and lower in the sky. And okay, now I want to look at Aldebaran 90 degrees away. I could, without looking at the sky, just take my telescope and rotate it over about 90 degrees and know I'm a lot closer to where I want it to be. And that's what Hubble does. It has a dumb set of gyros that say, all right, I know I want to be 93.27 degrees left and a certain number of degrees down and a certain number of degrees of roll away from where I last was because I knew exactly where I last was. So command those changes and get me in the neighborhood. The specification was that I needed to be within 30 to 90 arc seconds, which is really, really small. That's one, less than one and a half or fewer arc seconds, which is what, one twentieth of the diameter of the moon. So after doing a blind move, I'm pointed to the next target within one twentieth of the diameter of the moon. That's the course pointing, okay? So that's, that's the slew. And then from that point, my little finder doohickey goes to the middle of where I expected the star to be and starts spiraling out. It does a spiral because the middle was where I really thought, I was really hoping it would be. And if I have only random errors, it's probably closer to that than any of the corner of the boxes. I mean, there were people who said, all right, start here and start looking this way. Now we'll go to the middle and start looking from there and keep on going and going until I get something that's as bright as what I think my target star should be. Um, and then go to the other guy, let's say here's where I started, go, look for the second star in here, and now look for that guy. And after I find the second star, what's the separation between them? Is that what it was supposed to be? And I should be able to know that number very accurately. I don't know the brightness that well. It's a problem brightness I'll talk about later. But I get to the right neighborhood, find two stars, got a pretty good bet. Actually, if both of them pass the brightness test and I pass the separation test, then I assume I'm right, and I start taking pictures, and it will be an hour until I find out I was wrong. By which time, you know, whatever, however long the picture takes to collect and send down. Um, and if it fails, 
I lose the observation because I don't have a second guess. If I don't find one of the stars, it can be programmed with some second guesses. I say, well, try these other guys because maybe the data was wrong. So that's getting to the neighborhood, getting it in the finder. Once it gets in the finder, the same little sensor, instead of doing a spiral, does a little very small circle with a 1.6 arc second radius. Little, little nutation. And if you're really centered, and this is because once I, once I find it in the spiral, I have to mechanically stop, the, it's mechanical scan motion. I have to mechanically stop it and get back to that position. During that time, it may have drifted. So I'm assuming it hasn't drifted more than about three arc seconds between the end of the finder scan and the time I'm, I'm, I do into the uh, course track. This is called course track mode. So I do a little circle. The star should be in the middle, which means the brightness every point around the circle should be equal, conceptually. Think of it as a circle, a circular aperture. So I'm sort of skirting around. If it's a little bit off, it'll be brighter left or right or up or down. And what I do is I average the top minus the bottom, and I average the left minus the right, and call that an error signal. Tell the telescope, move over. Keep moving until it's the same up, down, left, right. And one of the things I did on Hubble, Ball Brothers wanted to sell us a box. They said it would cost a million dollars to do that, a little camera. And um, when well, I said, yeah, OK, that's good enough. When they finally get down to selling it to the NASA, it was $4 million. And we needed three of them, plus spares. And I figured out a way we didn't need it at all. And I got a bonus for that. Um, <laughs> because ultimately, we were doing something much more precise, the next step. Um, I said, gee, we're doing, this, we're doing this hard thing here. Why are we paying to do this coarser thing? We can use the same motor encoder, motor drives, that we're doing this small motion to make the thing go in a little circle. And yeah, it'll shake the spacecraft a little bit, but 1.6 arc seconds is not a lot of shaking. And so we figured out how to tell the Ball Brother guys, thank you very much, we don't need your box. They were not happy. CT503 tracker. Um, OK, so after it does that, it says, all right, so now I've got it. I'm pretty close. Now I've got to get the final error signal. So it goes up and it comes down diagonally with this crosshair thing because these crosshairs are not like vision crosshairs, they're sensor crosshairs. So I come down across the star and I see when bleep, I see it in the x axis and then bleep, I see it in the y axis and that tells me how far off I am at the order of a few thousandths of an arc second. And that's, that's the fine error signal. And what it's showing here, if that number is correct, the full, the full range of sensing there is four tenths of an arc second which is something that no telescope on this field can see. Um, but that's why Hubble's a big telescope, because you can see that. You buy a big telescope, you, got, you, you buy into problems. You know, it's, it's the accessories that yeah. kill you. Um, especially if they don't give you a tripod. And this is just a picture of, uh, I, I believe this is to scale on the horse head, for example. This entire, um, this entire diameter is the size of the moon. So the full focal surface of Hubble is about the size of the moon. And each of these occupies 1 60th of a square degree. So it's not very big. That's the whole area you have to find it. Now, that gets to the problem, which, OK. When you say, all right, I'm going to look anywhere in the sky and put a faint fuzzy someplace on the camera. And I have these three boxes, and I need to find two stars, one in each of two of these boxes. And each box is 1 60th of a square degree and other stuff. And you turn the crank. The answer is you need to be able to look at guide stars as faint as 14.5. OK, so these are stars fainter than most telescopes can see with the main thing. Now, we're using the entire 2.4 meter telescope as the guide scope and the finder scope. So we have a lot of light coming in. There was a problem, though. When Hubble was first envisioned and scoped out what they call the phase A study, and these numbers were known then and said you have to do 14.5 magnitude, they thought the diameter of the telescope would be three meters. And they said, OK, we got enough signal to noise. We can do this. Uh, because it also has, by the way, I didn't mention, it has to measure it 
you can't, you can't dwell on this. You have to measure it 40 times a second because that, those motor drives on the solar arrays and things, they can cause little vibrations. And this thing actively damps out vibrations. So it measures its direction 40 times a second, not like once every couple of seconds you push the button left or right. So you don't have much time to integrate. With a three meter mirror, eh, we can do it. 2.4 meter mirror is less than half as much light. Can't do it, really. What they had to do was redesign the optical system which they had in mind to do all this wonderful stuff and get rid of a whole bunch of things which were reducing the throughput. And that was another major and very expensive activity. Basically doing origami, saying, what if I put this here and this here and this here and this here? Can I do it with fewer mirrors and fewer lenses? Because even though they're very, very good mirrors and very, very good lenses, every time you go on an interface, you lose something. And uh, it was really hard. OK. Um, so we need to find stars down to 14.5. We have to know that they're stars because it's going to be pointed at with an interferometer. So it needs a point source. It can't be a compact galaxy. It can't be a double star. It's got to be a discrete, non-resolved star at 14.5. You have to know the position with respect to the thing you're going to look at eventually. You have to know the position with respect to the other guy, such that I can differentiate. You have to have the brightness estimate good enough so that if there is 14.3 and 14.6 and 14.1, and you're looking for the 14.5, you find the 14.5. Because there's no guarantee that there's only one star in the field. There's only one you want. But we'll see later some numbers. God unfortunately made the sky non-uniform. If he had spread the stars out uniformly and hadn't given us a Milky Way, life would be easy. But he put all the stars together, all the faint ones are together in one band, and all the bright ones are off on the other side at the, near the galactic poles. Um, so when you make the thing sensitive enough to work at the galactic poles where there aren't many stars, you get overwhelmed in the vicinity of the, uh, of the uh, Milky Way. Um, and you have to estimate the brightness in the response system of the sensor, which is not pure, pure V and not pure R. It's got its own sensitivity, which was the best that could be done. Because we're fighting for all these photons, so we didn't make it a V system. We made it a Hubble system of, of color response. And, um, and by the way, you can't launch the telescope and then start noodling around for guide stars because you don't know what the projects are going to be. Thing gets launched, starts working, guy comes in, he's a senior guy, he gets his, uh, gets his project approved, he wants to look there. You can't say, come back in five months and I'll get you the guide stars. So the idea was to have all this done before launch so that whatever was approved to be done, you'd have the whole sky done. Um, based on these Palomar, I'm sort of jumping ahead a little bit, but Palomar was good beyond 14.5. So we've got to convert this collection of a couple thousand glass plates into something which a computer can handle. The Palomar guys had never done anything except make prints. All major observatories had these, and all major research libraries had complete sets of the Palomar Sky Survey, a bunch of 14-inch square contact prints from 14-inch square negatives, um, and a couple thousand of them in custom-made containers or in hanging files all over the world. Uh, so people knew what they wanted to look at, but it wasn't anything the computer could read. And something else I haven't measured, while two of these guys are pointing the telescope, the third guy can be noodling around looking at interesting stars that might have high proper motions, and that's called the astrometric function of Hubble. So the, the redundant, the extra FGS, can be making precision astrometric measurements of things whose absolute position is not well known or maybe is moving, either because it has a high proper motion or an asteroid. So you also want to support that, which is, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but it made life interesting. Okay, this is the non-uniformity uh, map. This, I believe, is the density of stars per square degree at magnitude 15. 
uh, or four, uh, 14. Uh, and what it's saying is you're getting about 70 stars per square degree um, at the pole, and you're getting something more than 250 stars per square degree at the galactic center, the vicinity of the galactic center. And I said that the, the field of view of each one of those FGSs was, was roughly uh, a 60th of a square degree. So that means you're getting uh, about 1.1 star on average per FGS at the pole, and you're getting four to five stars per FGS near the galactic equator. Now, there are, there are many other problems in the galactic equator that I won't get into, but this is a study that came out from John Bacall at the Institute for Advanced Studies um, as he started refining. And what they have to, had to do in, in about 19, this was done about 1978, 1980, they didn't have these counts, they didn't have these numbers, but what they had was models of what they thought the galaxy looked like in three dimensions based on what they thought the evolution was. And what they did was they, take, they took the three-dimensional model of what the galaxy should look like and said, what would those stars look like from where we think the Earth is? So this is a synthetic <coughs> star density. But no one had real data at magnitude 14.5. All these guys who were making the catalogs and, and atlases to navigate to the new world were not interested in 14.5. As a matter of fact, no one has ever been interested in 14.5 except for this applied astrometric engineering application, if you're going to use them for something. And by the way, I don't have to know what it's called. I don't care about it. I just need to know there's a star there that won't move. And it's not a galaxy. I'm behind. So how do we do that? OK, took the Palomar sky surveys. They made copy negatives from the original glass plates. Um, and Palomar goes down to about declination minus 30. There's a European Southern Observatory extension that goes all the way down. So the Palomar at the same, roughly the same scale and the same limiting magnitudes. Palomar is actually both red and blue, so you can get a color index. There are two plates of every scene. I think each plate's roughly six degrees square, I forget. Um, and we'll see the numbers, I forget what it what the total number is. Um, look at both colors to get the magnitude in the red, the magnitude in the blue, so you get a color index and you can guess or estimate what the brightness will be in the Hubble system um, because neither blue or red is exactly what Hubble sees. Um, in some cases there was pre-existing information about how these guys are moving. The Palomar plates were taken about 1950. We're planning on observations in 1985, that's 35 years. It turns out that there are a significant number of relatively bright stars that are moving so fast that the measurement you make in 1950 is not good enough for Hubble in 1985. So you have to move it over based on any known proper motion. That became more of a problem later on. Um, calibrate the brightness scale of each plate because these pictures were not taken to be brightness indicators, they were taken to be position indicators. So, and, and film is notoriously bad for estimating brightnesses. So we had to calibrate each plate individually because aside from other things, since we're getting second copies, you have the original negative from which you make a copy positive, from which you make a copy negative. Three kinds of chemical processing, they're not the same. So got a couple thousand plates, all of which need separate calibration. Um, calibrate the astrometric distortion because the uh, Schmidt cameras are notoriously distorting. They're very clean images, they have a little bit of comb at the edge, but they're not uniform scale. So you have to, now once you calibrate the camera pretty well, you're, you're pretty much there. But since some of them were taken from Palomar and some of them were taken from South America and some were taken elsewhere, each one had to be calibrated separately. And then convert it, get it inside the computer somehow. Um, and along the way, make sure you tell the difference between stars and galaxies and all the other stuff, and scratches and dirt and random noise. Um, can't use stars which are too bright for two reasons. One of which, the Hubble is so sensitive, can't use, for this purpose, you can't use anything brighter than fourth. That would saturate the system. 
That's, that's like, oh, you know, turn off the, the, the spotlight. And on the plates, bright stars turn into big, ugly circles, and you can't estimate their positions well. You have a question? It looks like you're yeah. forming. OK. Defects green. Oh, yeah. And store it someplace where we can get it. <clears throat> so this is a picture of the, the Schmidt that was used. And this is a, a random image of, of, what the, oops, of what the negative looks like. Um, and you can see here are anonymous faint stars. I, I'm, those are probably about 20th, approaching the limit. Here's a star that's too big to use, too, too bright to use. You can see it's starting to get a, um, a, a halation circle, what they call. Um, it's got spikes, which is a problem, too. And then you have galaxies. And you have to measure, basically, the size. You measure the size of each dot to tell how bright it is. But if the dot is asymmetric, you say, nah, it's not a star, it's a galaxy. So you've got probably some galaxies in here which are smaller than the stars. But only by measuring the asymmetry can you differentiate between stars and, ga and galaxies. At 14, there's not a lot of confusion. As you start getting fainter, the confusion increases. So this is what was used. And the, the ones in blue, I'm looking at the date. The ones in blue which were, are the ones which were scanned originally. And then the ones in beige were the ones which were additionally scanned before launch, or at least started to supplement to compensate for color errors, incomplete coverage, and proper motion. They started, um, we had, the, this is the original Polymer Observatory Sky Survey. 1E is the red film, uh, I'm sorry, Polymer Observatory Sky S Survey 1, E is red, O is blue. Then there's a quick V survey, which was used to complete the photometric measurements. And then you've got this, uh, the European Southern, uh, what they call J plates, uh, which was basically red, and the extended red. And someplace here is the number of them, I think. Oh no, I left that off. Hmm? Number of plates right next to the picture. Right. Why can't I survey, survey, emotion, band, depth? It's going there. Number of plates, right. OK. So 2,000, 2,600, uh, another 800, 3,400, 3,500, roughly 3,500 individual glass plates to be scanned. Now, these are um, 350 millimeters square. They're going to be scanned at 10 microns resolution. That's 35,000 pixels on a side. That's a gigapixel per plate. And uh, so you got what? We got, we got some number of terapixels of data, terabytes of data coming in, which all has to be crunched to see which ones are the stars. OK. So how I sold two PDS microdensitometers and made no commission. When this problem came up, when, they, when, when people realized how much scanning would have to be done, um, I was on the, the liaison from Perkin Elmer to the astrometry team. And they started looking at how many plates had to be scanned and how long it took to scan each plate, like an hour per plate, or maybe more. And what they anticipated the launch date to be, they said, we can't scan, forget about the number crunching, can't scan them all physically. No one's ever been able to do this. The state-of-the-art machine for doing this was called a, a, a PDS-2020G scanning microdensitometer, the G standing for granite. The, the optical components are all mounted on a moving granite slide. The, the, plate is going, the plate is going slowly this way. OK, yeah. The, the plate is going slowly this way, uh, is going slowly this way, and the scan head is going this way. And the scan head, the, the receiver and the transmitter, the light source and the detector, are mounted on a U yoke of granite, which is on slides that are moving on another piece of granite made by Rock of Ages and the, the gravestone maker. They make the optical tables out of granite. 
This thing weighs many tons to have thermal stability because you don't want the thing to wander around in the hour it takes at 10 microns to go back and it's making one point at a time, back and forth and back and forth. Um, and they said, the length of time we've got between now and launch, the number of plates we have to do, it can't be done. And I was a guy who said, buy two. No one in the world had ever bought two of these things because they barely needed one. And they take a long time to build. Um, but it was being made by a different division of Perkin Elmer, so I didn't get a commission. Yale has one. Uh, University of Virginia has one. There aren't many. There are a lot of 10 by 10s. OK, this is what it looks like. Uh, and this is after it moved into sort of new quarters at the Space Telescope Institute. And there's, there's another one in the room next to it. Um, they did need two to do it, even though they had five years more than they thought to do the job. Uh, and this is sort of what it looks like. You've got a light source down here, which can either illuminate the whole thing to give you a rough idea where you are on a viewer, or a microscope which projects a point of light about 20 microns in diameter up onto the plate, and then another microscope lens which illuminates a, a 10 micron aperture and allows 10 microns of light to get into the photomultiplier tube. So you make a measurement and then you go on and make another measurement. And it's limited by the I.O. rate of the computer they had at the time, which was a, a PDP-11, um, which was controlling it. So they bought copies of all these plates, they put it in the room next door, and people spent years taking a plate out, putting it on, letting it scan for an hour. Luckily it had two machines, so if you did things right, you could work on one while the other was scanning. We spent a lot of effort. This is, this is mounted in the basement of um, the Space Telescope Institute on an isolated foundation. So it goes right down. There isn't any bedrock in Baltimore, that part of Baltimore. But it goes down to undisturbed, um, fragmented rock. It's a, where's Lyle? He could tell me what it is. But it, it goes down. It doesn't go to the same foundation as the rest of the building. And each one of them is sitting on its own. And they said you use the, uh, it's, it's used in observatories too, you use the coffee cup test. You put it down, you jump on the floor next to it. If the coffee cup doesn't ripple, then it's, it's good enough. But all, all this black stuff here is granite. Well, this is aluminum, but. Um, and it was updated, they originally had mechanical um, readouts. They updated it to laser readouts to measure exactly where the aperture was as it went back and forth. Um, and it's not just a question of knowing, as I was saying, not just where these dots are on the thing, but you have to know how bright they were. So um, the Space Telescope Institute through NASA contracted with the Air Force, who was operating an automated telescope at that time on uh, uh, Cloudcroft, New Mexico, which is near the National Solar Observatory. Uh, and it's actually now part of the National Solar Observatory. But they had what's called a three-axis a three-axis automated telescope, which was being used then to, to look at satellites. But it was automated and programmable and had a photomultiplier on it. So what you could do was program in at least five stars from each of the Palomar plates, whatever, 2,000, all the ones you could see. Um, so you're making photometric measurements of 10, 15,000 stars so that you can get a calibration curve for each of the plates. And they contracted with somebody down in Chile to do the same thing in the Southern Hemisphere. Like I said, it's the accessories that get you. OK, getting sort of to the end. So the Palomar, this is, this is actually from a German site. This is an example of, I guess, M31 in red and blue. I don't know which one's which. And it gets scanned in the scanned version. And there's some digital equivalent to this overlay, and I don't know who made it or why, but um, this is an overlay that effectively shows you where all stars were detected on that field of view. Um, so you're getting two things. From the scanning, you're getting a digital version of the photograph. You're getting an unedited atlas plate. Separately, the computer is going through and crunching all of these black dots in the data 
and saying, this is a star, this isn't a star, this is a scratch, this is dust, and estimating the brightness. It's saying, here's the sequence of black dots I've got, and I know this dot was magnitude 16, and this dot from the calibration, this one was 12, and this one was 8, and I interpolate between them. And eventually that came out as the, the, the first guide star catalog in the 1980s. It measured 20 million stars down to magnitude 14. They didn't feel comfortable in actually trying to do it. The, the image analysis wasn't good enough to do it below 14. So it's believed to be complete to magnitude 14. And then later on it was done again when they had the rest of the plates in that table I showed, uh, which allowed them to get more proper motions, which was getting to be more and more of a problem. As you get further and further from 1950, more and more of the stars that you're trying to use are not where they were on the scale of Hubble. So they paid for a second set of images from Palomar, second set of images from the Southern Observatories, did the rescanning at, ten, at higher resolution, I think it was eight or six microns, had more time, and now you're up to 945 million stars down to magnitude 21. And the first Guide Star Catalog was uh, an edited version of it was put out by uh, Astronomical Society of the Pacific and anybody could buy it. And that's basically the key. This was done at public expense and it was put into the public domain. And from that point on, everybody had everything. So whereas SAO was a very good endeavor, but only got you down to ninth, by this point, you had 14th. And if you didn't buy the disks, you could go online and get the same data if you really cared. And that, that formed the essence of the catalogs we have today. Um, when people actually were trying to use it, this is the way the, the photometric calibration came out on the scanned, Im uh, not on the scanned images, for the original plates. What happened was we, we printed up, this was on an eight and a half, 11 piece of celluloid, um, the kind of stuff people used to use for overhead projector slides. And so this, this dimension was eight and a half by 11. And in here, is a drawing at the scale of the Palomar plates and the European southern plates of what that moon size focal plane looked like. So you could take this overlay and just pick out your favorite part of the sky, flap it down. Um, there's a trick, one part of the telescope, one side of the telescope always has to face the sun. So you had to get this direction, you probably can't read it, but it says norm, uh, normal sun that arrow which is pointing down has to point to the sun at the date you want to make the observation. So you have to look that up someplace. And if you get two stars that are at least as bright as, well this is, this is the cheat sheet for it. Um, so let's say in the Palomar red, 14th magnitude is about dot n. So this dot here, the last one on the right on the middle line, if you have very good eyesight, if you see a dot at least that big, you're a winner. If you don't see a dot at least that big, you don't have a guide star. Maybe you have to wait until the sun comes around here and the whole thing rotates. You might have to wait six months to get guide stars. If you're close to the galactic center, um, it gets more complicated. You have plenty of guide stars, but the the guys in mission control are going to say, you got too many guide stars. I can't tell one from the other. Uh, and there are some other tricks to get around that. But this thing is traditionally in astronomy called a fly spanker in the sense of a, a fly swatter. Because when people were making photometric estimates from plates, they would have little sheets of photographic negative, which they had made up in the lab. Little sheets, about half an inch by an inch and a half, on a stick, which had little dots on it. And they'd know this dot was such and such magnitude. And the thing looked like a fly swatter, except it was so small, you, all you could do with a fly was spank it. Um, so this was, this was, the, this was the Hubble uh, fly spanker. And it shows the calibrations for the Palomar red, the Palomar blue, and the, uh, the, the European southern red, separate calibrations. And this was the approximate calibration that was typical of each of those surveys. OK, this is near the end. Now that's, that's the Sloan digital camera. 
the guide star catalog represents a transition in what was available in the technology. It was taken photographically, it was taken systematically, as opposed to the previous missions, which had been an attempt at comprehensive, but not calibrated, not systematic. With money and effort and skill, Hubble created a consistent catalog of the entire sky, down to initially 14 and later 21. But it did it from photographic material, which is always iffy, both geometrically and photometrically. Converted it to computer form so that automated operational procedures could use these stars for finding, guiding, and tracking. Uh, what happened was, because it was in the public domain, all this stuff became publicly available, everybody got to use it, both professional and amateur astronomers. So things like Google Sky picked it up, Microsoft Telescope. It led to some standardization, not great standardization, in how you're going to represent digital representations of star catalogs, because somebody had to do it. We don't want to be like Flamsteed and come out with a great catalog and forget to put the number on it. You know, have somebody else have to figure out to put a number on it. Um, and it, it led to digital planetaria because you knew all the stars, you could zoom in, you could show a telescope field, show the field for a 40 inch daub, showing the faint stars, you can do all that if you have it all in the database. Uh, Carte de Ciel is one that um, is very flexible. It can go out to the web and I think it can go out, but it, it can grab all the current ones, starting with the GuideStar catalog. Uh, one, GuideStar Catalog, two, Sloan Digital Survey. Um, things get built into your go-to scope with, with reliable coordinates. Uh, and, and the newest thing, which is a whole separate topic, but what people are calling virtual observatories, where I now have this framework of stars. When I take special plate material that goes deeper or in more colors, I can reference it to the stars in the GuideStar Catalog or GuideStar Catalog 2 or, or uh, Sloan and know where my new zoomed in high precision image fits in the scale of things. By the way, Sloan did not do the entire sky. It's not comprehensive. So I think there's still parts of the sky which rely on other people's surveys. Um, it's, it started what was intrinsically digital data because now things like Sloan take the pictures initially digitally. They have much less nonlinearity than the photographic process. So that's better. Um, and then people build other parts of the spectrum. They do precise astrometry on some of the stars. And now all of this stuff can be put into digital databases. So I have a complete inventory of stars to maybe 21. I have a complete precise position maybe down to 16 uh, with, with uh, Tycho or Hipparchus. And people go back multiple times now and they see the ones that are moving. They see the ones that are variable because uh, Sloan goes back again and again and again, looks for anomalies, things that have time variation. And that all adds to the database. So the point with that is these catalogs are now becoming intrinsically very uh, valuable in their own right because they have more than just the position and approximate brightness of a whole bunch of anonymous stars. You can look at the things that Sloan picked up and see things which are anomalous, because they also look in multiple bands. Strange color, strange variability, strange motion and then spend more time looking at it. And I think that's about it. So over 35 years, we've moved where only a few people had access to the best material, and it was hard to use so that everybody can get the best thing, basically. Maybe a little bit hard to, to know how to use it, but it's a lot easier than it used to be. And you didn't have to be at a prestigious research location to get access to it. Um, by the way, I hadn't realized, but in looking up some stuff, there is still a copy of the Palomar Sky Survey at NRAO, because even the radio guys need it. They need to find the optical component correspondent. When they come up and they say uh, they detect a strange twinkle someplace in the radio, they want to look what's in the optical spectrum at that point. Usually they're looking for something blue. They're looking for something which is much brighter in the O plate than the, uh, than the E plate. But, um, they have to go back to that. They can also go to their computer and go to the Space Telescope Institute or one of the other data repositories and get the, the Sloan stuff too. But sometimes it's just easier to look at a picture. Uh, that's still true. So I think that's it for me. Didn't keep you too late. I'd be glad to answer uh, any questions that you have.
Yeah. In the, the whole catalog space, how does the USNO catalog space? Um, there, um, their up-to-date catalog is called Nomad. Right. And it is now, I think, the catalog of catalogs um, for most purposes. So it sort of replaced the SAO. And I don't know if they have incorporated the GuideStar catalog or they point to it. <coughs> I think Nomad is now the database which has the most stuff in it. Yeah, I was just thinking objects in Astroplan. I think it's probably because Nomad is included uh, Sloan. I suspect. I think people go to Sloan to look more for the faint fuzzies. Right. And USNO has pulled out the point things. I don't know if they also Nomad include the, the non-stellar object. I, I don't know that much about it. Uh, yeah. But USNO still has a lead. There still is sort of a, uh, an agreement through the International Astronomical Union on which observatories take the lead in which comprehensive things. Variable stars with Russia, minor planets were done at Harvard, USNO does primary catalogs. Uh, the Germans had precise astrometric catalogs, AGK-5 and maybe now AGK-6. Um, so each, each, nation, each major uh, observatory can go to the IAU and, and raise its hand and say, I'll do this. Uh, and, and they get along with that, because most people don't have the money for duplication. So they're willing to let one guy do it. And you know, the separate historical stuff on, on the history of cooperation, even during wartime, among major observatories, especially European ones, uh, came up in the stories of transit of Venus, how um, the French and Brits and I don't know who else basically cooperated, uh, even though they were fighting each other. And, oh, you're doing science, okay. <laughs> you're a geek, okay. You're, you're okay. <laughs> Anything else? Sun's going down, people want to go get their telescopes. <laughs> I know, I appreciate that. Thank you.